Well, let me open us up in prayer and we'll get into the study. Lord God, thank you for this whole study of John that we've been through, but particularly John chapter 21, Lord. You have so many blessings in this text that we get to unpack together, Lord. And I pray that you would just open all of our hearts to your word, that you would allow it to speak to us, that you allow our hearts to receive the truth that's in it, that we would come to you with transparency and realize that we are sinners in need of grace and that you are the one and only Savior. But I pray that you would impress these things on our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we have an interesting map today where we're going to go. I'm going to start off back in Jerusalem. And you may not realize where they actually had this whole sea encounter, but it's really far up to the north. It's the entire, okay, first we're going to look at the resurrection here. And then we're going to go all the way up to the north and look at the Sea of Galilee. And after this encounter, we can tell from the other Gospels that they, go all, they turn around and go all the way back to Jerusalem because he ascends to heaven from back around the Temple Mount. So he's, they, the, he has the disciples doing a lot of traveling in this part. So that is fascinating. So let me uh, start off with the year 1927. So there was a 21-year-old Dietrich Bonhoeffer who had just finished his doctorate of theology at Berlin University in Germany. He was an unlikely Christ follower. At this point in his life, his love of God was mainly intellectual. He loved to study the Bible. He loved to think about theology. In his mind, theology was just another occupation. His life goal was to become an influential teacher and a renowned witness for Christ. But despite his ambitions, at the time Bonhoeffer would admit that he was at best a lukewarm follower of Christ. Maybe you feel like you kind of identify with Dietrich Bonhoeffer. As he began to build up his career in theology, he started looking for teaching opportunities around the church, and he was hired into a teaching fellowship in the United States. So he moved to the United States, but everything wasn't as he had hoped it would be. His main teaching work was a job as a Sunday school teacher, of all things, at an inner city church in Harlem, New York. But as he persevered in this work in in Harlem, he started to feel a sense of compassion for the students that he taught and the struggles that they were going through in the 1920s in Harlem. He started to grow a pastor's heart. And as he witnessed up close the injustice that they faced in a deeply racist society, he began to look at them in the way that Christ sees them. And he started to gain a new perspective that would change his faith forever. It didn't take long before Bonhoeffer the intellectual was becoming Bonhoeffer the imitator of Christ. But in 1935, his faith was tested. He felt called to return to Germany, and he saw a place that had changed dramatically since he had left. The Nazi movement had spread like wildfire. Hitler had begun closing down Christian churches. He called the faith weak, and he said that it was founded on lies, and that was the reason why he he closed them down. Bonhoeffer's passion for the church made him realize that he had to act quickly. So he launched an evangelistic underground movement to train up new pastors in Germany and teachers to spread the gospel and to weather the storm of this Nazi aggression. When the Gestapo learned what he was doing, they shut down his illegal seminaries and they deported him out of Germany. So feeling powerless to help his German brothers, Bonhoeffer took out his frustration on his pen and he wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. It's a fascinating book. So here's one of the most powerful quotes in this book. He said, the cross is laid on every Christian The first Christ suffering which every man must experience is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. It is that dying of the old man which is the result of his encounter with Christ. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death. Thus it begins. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. You see, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. 
Bonhoeffer didn't just speak those words. He also lived that out. In 1941, he decided he's going to sneak back into Germany and he's going to try to save the church there. And he was quoted as saying, I must live through this difficult period with the people of Germany because I have no right to participate in the reconstruction of the church after the war if I do not share in the trials of this time with my people. Sadly, two years after he snuck back in, Bonhoeffer was captured, arrested, transferred to a concentration camp, he was stripped of his clothing, and he was executed by hanging. Just two weeks after his hanging, the U.S. Army liberated that very camp. What we find is that as Bonhoeffer increasingly followed Jesus with all of his heart, his life began to look more and more like the life of Christ. He began imitating Christ as a witness, but then he began imitating Christ as a pastor. And finally, he began imitating Christ as a self-sacrificing evangelist. Along the way, he started to find joy in the places where Jesus found joy. He willingly endured suffering in some of the ways that Jesus willingly endured suffering. In his darkest moments, Bonhoeffer might have looked at the words of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5 and found deep encouragement. Here's what Paul said. Be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. We find ourselves all wanting to imitate Christ. And and on the surface, maybe we're trying to do that, but we grimace at the fine print of what that involves. Imitating Christ means at times loving people who are unlovable, Sometimes it means dying to, or sorry, denying the desires of our flesh. And ultimately, it means maybe giving up our lives. Even Jesus would remind us in Matthew 10 that whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Because whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. You know, I find that many Christians will measure the size and the weight of the cross. They'll look at how rugged and splintered it is. They'll estimate the distance over which it must be carried. And they will decide that they would rather not imitate Christ. Where do you stand on that issue? How willing are you to take up your cross and follow him? Well, as Bonhoeffer learned, it was not easy to do this. But at the same time, the thought of ignoring God's call in his life was equally horrifying. What if you someday stood before God in heaven and got to glimpse the life that you could have lived by imitating Christ? What if you got to see the impact that it made and the glory that it shined towards God? And what if you lived a life that imitated Christ? But here we are, people have said about Bonhoeffer that the time they spent with Dietrich was just like they imagined it would be, in, it would be like if they were like with Christ. Would anyone say that about you? The time I spent with fill in the blank was just like what I imagined it was like to be with Christ. The time I spent with Bob was just like what I imagined it would be like to be with Christ. The time I spent with Steve was just like I imagined it would be like to be with Christ. Is imitating Jesus honestly a priority in your life today? Honestly, most of us struggle to answer yes to that question. So let me ask you this question. What is keeping you from imitating Jesus? Maybe you would say, I feel inadequate, or I lack the integrity to be like Jesus. Or maybe you'd say, my heart just doesn't have the capacity to love like Jesus. So as we list off all the reasons why imitating Jesus has been difficult for us, we find ourselves coming up with area after area in our life where our human strength has failed us. Truth be told, every deficiency in our lives where we struggle to imitate Jesus is a place in our life that is in need of God's power to change us. For example, you may feel inadequate, but Scripture tells us that God's power is made perfect in weakness. We're told that the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the Spirit living within us. 
You may struggle with temptation or selfishness, but the fruits of the Spirit promise to change the desires of our heart. You may feel like your heart is too small, but God promises to give us a new heart. You see, all the ways that we lack the ability to be truly Christ-like are the places in our lives where we require God's power to transform us. What areas of your life are you struggling to imitate Christ in? What is keeping you from imitating Christ? Too often we have stopped trying. We've just given up believing that this is even possible. But we have a God who says, with God all things are possible. And his word follows it up, promising that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. We find ourselves wanting to know how it's possible to truly imitate Christ, and yet unsure of what to do next. So well, it turns out this last chapter of John is, talks about Jesus' final words to his disciples that instructs how to imitate Christ how to imitate his life and his ministry. Let's explore what he did and said in this passage by looking at three sections. Okay, so first we're going to look at how do I reach people like Jesus? How do I imitate Christ the evangelist? And then second, we'll consider how do I love people like Jesus? How do I imitate Christ the pastor? And then lastly, how do I lead people to know God like Jesus did? How do I imitate Christ's witness about the power of God. Okay, so before we begin in John 21, though, we got to take a short detour into a passage that John's audience would have known very well from the Gospel of Luke. We see in Luke chapter 5 that Jesus was first introduced to his disciples on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. So that day, as Jesus stood on a boat teaching a crowd of Galileans... Simon Peter listened from his boat, exhausted after a night of fishing where he caught no fish. And he marveled at Jesus' ability to reach the crowd with teaching about God in a way that he had never seen before. In verse 4 of Luke, it says, When Jesus had finished speaking, he looked at Simon and said, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they, ca they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. He and his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John's, J John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners." So it wasn't just the moment when they witnessed Jesus reaching that crowd of Galileans with powerful teaching. It was the moment that Jesus reached three unlikely fishermen to become disciples. Magnetically, they were drawn to Jesus. They had seen something so special that they wanted to learn about it. They wanted to know how they could imitate his ability to reach people for God. That day, their life was changed dramatically because from now on, they will fish for people. But clearly, they did have a lot to learn that day. And sure, they had caught a lot of fish in their nets, but they were unable to bring the fish to market. As they pulled up their nets into the boat, the nets all snapped, and the boats nearly tipped over. Symbolically, they needed Jesus to disciple them, not to just catch fish, but also how to steward the catch when it was too big for them to handle on their own. So then we fast forward three years later. These disciples have been through thick and thin with Jesus. They've watched him perform miracle after miracle after miracle. They've seen him be transfigured in glory on the mountaintop. They've seen him forced to sleep outside because he had no other place to lie his head. They've heard him teach amazing truth about the kingdom of God, and they've seen him die on the cross and raise three days later. And after all of that, here they are, years later, in the exact same lake, sitting on a boat with empty nets again, after fishing all night long. It was like deja vu all over again. After all they had been through, it would seem that metaphorically, they are still failing to imitate Jesus' ability to reach people. Quite the opposite, they haven't become effective fishers of men. 
And now it would seem that they aren't even effective fishers of fish. Have you ever wondered why, after all your years of learning from Jesus and following him, why are your nets still empty? Like these men, it seems like we should be good at fishing by now, after all the practice that we've had. But for many, our nets are still empty because something is missing in our lives. And that was the moment when a mysterious figure yelled from the shore. In verse 5, he called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. You know, actually, the, the Greek word that Jesus used for fish is even more disheartening than it sounds. It could be translated, have you even caught a single morsel yet? A fish stick, maybe. <laughs> so their, their defeated response says it all, shaking their heads. They can only muster the words, no, nothing. It brings to mind Jesus' words in, in John 15. He declared, apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus isn't on the boat, and we can do nothing on our own. We likely don't even understand how reliant on God we are from moment to moment. James once wrote, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And like a mist that vanishes, our plans to reach people, our ideas that are by our own will, are no more than a fading hope and a foolish attempt. But in verse 6, this stranger on the shore, who's, who's actually Jesus as we know, he speaks some useful advice to them. He says, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. I think if he had said this to me, I probably would have yelled back, you know, I've been doing that all night. What's that going to help? I might just politely wave and say thanks, but I know what I'm doing. But the disciples didn't do either of those things. Instead, they did something very odd. They actually listened to his advice. Here's a crazy idea for us today. What if we actually listened to God? That might work. In Jesus, we see an example of someone who loved listening. Jesus loved to listen. He, he would say things like this to his father. He said, Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. As if to say, I will listen to you instead of my own preferences. Jesus would tell parables to crowds of people, and he would start by urging them to listen and understand. And when the disciples did listen, when they decided to do it in the boat that day, the next thing that they did was they obeyed. Verse 6 tells us that when they did what he said, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. And when they saw the massive number of fish, they knew instantly who was responsible for the catch. John looked at Peter and said, it is the Lord. So first they listened, and then they obeyed, but then comes the hard part. It's the exact part they failed at three years earlier. Back then, they pulled the fish into their boat, and all the nets broke, and all the fish escaped, and they lost the whole thing. But in verse 8, we see that they have learned a critical lesson. They've learned how to rely on Jesus. The verse says, the disciples drove the boat back towards Jesus, towing the net full of fish to him. You see, they resisted the urge to immediately pull the fish into their own boat, and instead they brought it to the Lord. Jesus had taught them to be fishers of men. And he he said things like this in, in John 6. He said, all those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. You see, Jesus taught them where to bring the catch. Our job in evangelism is to take people to God, to point to him, to lead to him, to direct the way to him. In the end, he alone is able to receive the catch that we bring, and to him alone is the glory. Our efforts to pull the catch into our own boat will only be met with disappointment and frustration. Instead, we must obey the Spirit's prompting to lead believers to the foot of the cross where they belong. And as the fish were towed to Jesus, Peter who's a man who was once very overwhelmed by the sight of this gigantic catch of fish, he's now picked up the heavy net on the shore and he's dragging them by himself straight to Jesus. 
Peter's actions seem to say, here you go, Lord. These are yours. All to you I surrender. And in verse 11, they inspect the catch. And here's what they say. They say it was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. In that description of the catch, we see two very significant details about what they've caught. First of all, it says that it was a large catch of fish. I like how one of our group leaders on the Friday morning, he pointed out that Jesus is in the business of doing large things. Jesus doesn't send us the minnows and keep the marlins for himself. Jesus calls us to participate in a large calling to catch large fish for the kingdom. And then the second detail I see here is that we're told that it was exactly 153, which is a very specific detail. One of the rules of Bible study is that when you find an oddly specific detail like that, you better believe it's pointing to something significant. So you've got to stop for a minute and ask, why would God put that number in there? Well, it turns out that in the, in the days of John, as he wrote this, it was believed that there were exactly 153 different kinds of fish in the world. It's as if to say that Jesus will succeed in catching one of every kind. It's the same idea that's echoed at the end of Jesus' ministry in every one of the Gospels. Here's what the last chapter of Matthew says. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. In Mark it says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Luke tells us in the first chapter of Acts, it's a little bit later, but you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So in comparison, it might seem like John has left out that kind of a, a great commission moment. But here it is, tucked away in the number 153, reminding us that every tribe, people, language, and nation will be reached by his nets, and his nets won't break. In the end, we find that when the disciples listened to Jesus' teaching, and they obeyed the voice of God, then and only then could they succeed at becoming fishers of men. But it could only happen by his power. So here's our first principle. Obedience to the Spirit makes us fishers of men like Jesus. So just in case there's anyone here who thought Jesus' three years of discipleship with these fishermen produced spiritual all-stars that had all the answers, we're shown a picture of seven professional fishermen sitting in a boat with empty nets. They don't have a supernatural instinct for reaching people. They can't, with telekinesis or something, they can't just figure this out. They don't have a 10-step method that guarantees a full net. They can't speak a magical incantation to bring fish into the net. No, after years of learning from Jesus, it still comes down to relying on the power of God. And just like the disciples, we will not succeed by our own strength or wisdom. We will only succeed by yielding to the will of God and watching him perform the miracle through us. Evangelism does not happen because of our skill at communicating. It doesn't happen because of our brilliant exposition of scripture. It doesn't happen because we are so inspiring. Evangelism is not a matter of convince them, instruct them, and complete a step-by-step -step plan. Instead, here is the picture of evangelism that Jesus gives us to imitate. We will listen to the still, small voice of God. We will obey the calling that we receive in the moment, and we will point people to God. We listen, we obey, and we point. These verbs are both refreshing and challenging. I, I find them refreshing because those are easy things to do. I can listen, I can obey, I can point. Our role in this process is very simple, but it's also challenging to us because we have to rely on God's timing, God's call, and God's control. Today, you may have a friend or a loved one that is unsaved, and you feel kind of the weight of this this, uh, this burden to reach people for Christ. But Jesus reminds us that the fish may be waiting just underneath your boat right now. And he is the one who is going to bring them into the net. So we pray fervently for God's intervention to prepare ourselves for the coming, coming moment when it's time to follow Jesus' lead, when it's time to listen, obey, and point. Point. 
If that moment came today, would you be ready to listen, obey, and point? Well, our next section begins with a very intense moment that's been a long time coming here. So as Peter sits down for breakfast with Jesus, the elephant in the room is that there's still this unresolved tension between the two of them. You know, just a short time ago, on that fateful night when Jesus was arrested, Peter was disowning his Lord three times. And as he warmed his hands in front of, the different, of a different fire that night, Luke 22 does a great job of recording how shameful this moment was for Peter. Right as he was disowning Jesus, just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. They locked eyes in that moment when he when he denied him. Peter knew in that moment that he was a phony. He was a betrayer. And he responded by weeping bitterly. Mere hours earlier before that, Peter had, had boasted to Jesus, claiming that I will lay down my life for you. It revealed that Jesus knew Peter's heart much more than he did. And Peter learned some things about himself that day. His fear of death was an obstacle to his faith. His love for God was shallower than he wanted to admit. And now that he had denied his God, a deep divide, a rift had formed between him and Jesus. When have you felt like your actions created a rift between you and God? You know, one of the oldest stories in the Bible is that our sins separate us from God. This is the oldest story in the book. In Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve sinned, God said, he must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden. He drove the man out. He placed an angelic guard with a sword on the east side of, of the garden so he couldn't return. So you see, just like our banishment from the garden, our sins have distanced our relationship with God. And they've created a need in our life for reconciliation with God. It's a tragic experience for a believer because, you know, without God in our lives, our lives are, are void of joy and hope. But it's also tragic for God because God is our biggest fan. He loves us. He laid out good plans for us. He's given us a good purpose. But our sin has served to block his blessings and derail his plan. So as Jesus speaks to Peter, it's as if God is speaking to us wanting to reconcile with us and make things right with him. In verse 15, Jesus starts by saying to Peter, Simon, son of John. And that's a name that he hasn't heard in a very long time. That's the prior man. That's the guy he used to be, the one that cried out, go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. But his denial of Jesus has set him back to square one. Jesus continues by asking, do you love me more than these? He isn't questioned about his works, his orthodoxy, or his knowledge of doctrine. No, he was asked about his love. How would you answer if you were asked about your love? And not just the measure of his love, Jesus wants to know if it's more than these. It's hard to say what is these that he's talking about. We're not sure what Jesus is pointing at right now. Is it the fishing nets? Is it the gear? Is it the, the pile of fish? Is it his old job or his former way of life? Or is he asking if Peter loves him more than all the other disciples standing there? Perhaps the answer is yes. It's all those things. Do you love me more than anything else? Would you lay down your life for me as you said you would before? Well, if you look carefully at the Greek that word love loses something in its translation to English. The actual question being asked there is, do you agape me more than these? You know, and if you don't know Greek, agape is the highest and purest form of love. It's a sacrificial, others-focused, supreme love. It's the word that's used to describe the love that God has for us sinners. But in Peter's response, we see him give a very careful response. He says, yes, Lord. He said, you know that I love you. But Peter's word for love is a lesser form of love. It's not agape. It was phileo. It's like the kind of brotherly love. That's where you get the word Philadelphia from. It's that word brotherly love, phileo. 
It's a love of obligation and expectation. It's a common love. You see, in the upper room, Peter had boasted about his love for God, but he came to realize that there was no faking it with Jesus. Jesus knew his heart the whole time. There's no use in grandstanding. It's time to call a spade a spade. It's as if he's confessing that he realizes his love for God is imperfect. It's lesser than Jesus' love for him. He admits that his love is a work in progress, and dying for his faith still terrifies him to that moment. With all integrity, Peter can't say that he agapes Jesus. But Jesus doesn't rebuke him. Instead, he gives him a job to do. He says, feed my lambs. Lamb, a lamb is a, a poor, defenseless creature. In Luke 10, Jesus would, would say to be careful because I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. We find that Peter's hesitant love is enough for Jesus. Even though Peter's love for God is a work in progress, God can trust a repentant sinner with loving his lambs. And then in verse 16, the conversation kind of repeats itself a little bit. Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. So again, Peter kind of goes for this inferior form of love compared to what Jesus said. But the commission for Peter was very similar. Take care of my sheep. You know, Jesus is calling Peter to be a shepherd here. Do you realize the Latin word for shepherd is pastor? Your pastor of your church is the shepherd of that flock? Jesus wants Peter to be a pastor for the early church. You see, that even though Peter insists that his love for God is imperfect, God can trust a redeemed believer with pastoring the flock. And then finally in verse 17, for the third time, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you even phileo me? So now Jesus is going down to Peter's level. He's condescending. Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time. Peter responds, do you phileo me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. So as I said, Jesus now acknowledges Peter's lesser love. And he asked Peter to confirm that there's no boasting here. There's no exaggeration in this claim. This is the honest truth of your love for me. Peter confirms it and says, Lord, you know all things. There's no use in hiding it. In all honesty, no one can love others like the good shepherd can. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. That is agape love that he's talking about. Peter is willing to confess his love for God falls short of the standard for love. And rather than boast about perfect love and then just fall on his face again, Peter is willing to admit that he will love Jesus the best he can and confess that he needs God to still grow his heart. Like Peter, we are all doing our best to imitate the love of Christ. And like Peter, we find our love for Jesus falls short. How well does your love measure up to the love of Jesus? Well, here's my second principle. Willingness to sacrifice is the way to agape love like Jesus. Again, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And Peter's hesitancy to give up his life has become his stumbling block. But honestly, who could blame him? Who among us is prepared to give up their life for Christ right now? The truth of the matter is that Jesus understands that Peter is a work in progress, and so are we. But in the meantime, Jesus has a special calling for Peter. He wants Peter to pastor his people. It's among the highest callings that Jesus has to give caring for people and discipling them to know Jesus. And Jesus reveals what will happen at the end of Peter's career of pastoring. In verse 18, he prophesies that, Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. It's a hint that after a career of pastoring, Peter will be transformed. Peter would, would write in his epistle, 1 Peter, now for a little while, while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. 
You see, through the different trials that he faced as a pastor, sacrificial love was built up in his heart. He was sanctified. And until the time when Peter loved Jesus so much that agape love was coming out of his life. And like Peter, we are on a journey of imitating that agape love of Jesus. And like Peter, our greatest stumbling block might be our willingness to sacrifice right now. So here's what I learned from Peter. This is not about pretending that we are better at love than we actually are. No, Peter teaches us that we have to be self-aware of our love for God. And we have to follow Jesus where we're at and, and let him lead us where we need to be. How do you feel about giving up your life for Christ? I know for most of us, that's a terrifying thought. But I can tell you that step one is to begin feeding his lambs and caring for his sheep and feeding his sheep. In verse 19, Jesus gives Peter the two-word instruction that is for us as well. Follow me. What would it look like for you to really follow him? So let me close in our final section. In the Gospel of John, we see that Jesus has already shown us that Here's how you become an evangelist like Jesus in the first section. Here's how to become a pastor in the second section. And now this section is going to be about how to become a witness for Jesus. So Peter points out to to, uh, John to Jesus and says, but Lord, what about this guy? Perhaps the disciples wondered, is everyone going to go to the cross? Is that how this is going to end? But Jesus doesn't give specifics about every man's path. The thing he does reveal is this. Whatever John's future path will be, it will be centered on testifying to the truth of the gospel. Here's verse 24. It says, this is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. You know, it sounds vaguely familiar because it's similar to the chapter 1 statement. It says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. You know, for, throughout the gospel of John, we found John's witness to be very unique. For instance, you won't look in John's gospel, as we've learned this year, and find the Christmas story. You won't find the transfiguration on the mountaintop. You won't find some of the miracles that Jesus performed in this account. We ask him, is this the right way to witness about the kingdom of God? As as it turns out, there are times when Jesus also left out certain details. When he came, he didn't describe to us all the details of the Trinity. He didn't tell us all about every doctrine of theology. He didn't tell us when to expect the end times exactly. But here's what Jesus and John have in common about their witness. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You see, being a witness for Jesus is all about leading people to belief, and it's about surfacing the truth that leads people to that conclusion. John concludes by saying, Jesus did many other things. He admits that there's lots that he didn't say, but the things that he did include were the things that inspire belief that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that you may have life in his name. What would others say uh, that your witness for Jesus sounds like today? Is it centered on a bunch of judgment, theology, or grace, or forgiveness, or uh, ranting about the world falling apart? Well, John's gospel declares that our witness should be laser-focused on making sure that people believe. There are non-essentials all over the place, and if those were written down, not even the whole world would have enough room for the books that would be written. But Jesus and John agree on something important. If you have 30 seconds, if maybe you're in the elevator with somebody and need to share the gospel, be laser-focused. Focus your time on making certain that they believe. So here's my last principle. Leading others to believe in the gospel is the way to witness like Jesus. The Apostle Paul had a very similar point of view on how to use the, the, the uh, declaration of the gospel. He said, witnessing about Christ is foolishness to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven. It is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. 
But to those who are called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans. And God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. You see, our conversation in faith is full of non-essentials and details and traditions. But Jesus taught John something essential about carrying the gospel to the ends of the earth. Here's the secret. Make sure they believe John's approach to the gospel was different than all the other gospel writers. But Jesus gives him a special endorsement right here in the text. He says, we know that his testimony is true. And in the end, we we recognize that we'd like to imitate Jesus. And many of us feel like we're on a different planet than Jesus. But here's the wisdom of John 21. Jesus is calling us to be evangelists. But to do that, we have to be obedient to the Spirit. He's calling us to be pastors, but to do that, you have to be willing to sacrifice. And he's calling us to be witnesses, but we must be laser-focused on leading people to believe. These things are not predicated on your skill or my skill or our ingenuity. They are predicated on your faith. To imitate Jesus, we need rock-solid faith. That's really what it all comes down to. Were you expecting anything else? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the life of Jesus. We thank you for this gospel that we've gotten to study throughout the year. And Lord, you've given it to us so that we may believe. So Lord, I pray that you would help our hearts believe. We maybe believe intellectually, we believe on the surface, but we recognize that there are maybe some areas of our life where we are scared. We are untrusting. We are unreliable. Like Peter, maybe we're stumbling. We realize our love is imperfect. Lord, we recognize these are all areas where belief has not really penetrated our soul. And we ask you, Lord, to to just make us aware of those areas where we struggle to believe. I pray that you would heal our hearts and make us believe. In Jesus' name, amen.